if you are two years old all the way through third grade, you may exit towards the back and go to Bridge Kids if you would like to. That would be awesome. How about our worship team today, huh? <laughs> Woo! Man, I don't know about you, but um, I honestly have had one of those weeks, <laughs> and uh, it's just kind of been a struggle. So it was... Uh, exactly what I needed today. So thank you, worship team. You guys did an amazing, amazing job. Well, I get to kick off a brand new series today called How Did We Get Here? <laughs> and we've just been kind of talking around the office here this last few weeks and, and some of the conversations and, and looking at things that are happening out in our world today and our communities today. You know, maybe you've been on the news, maybe you've been, you know, on Facebook and seeing all the stuff that is going on and it's just kind of overwhelming, isn't it? Man, it's just that there's so much going on. There seems to be so many toxic conversations going on that it's almost hard to keep up with. And you get kind of involved and in, in, in looking at some of these conversations, and, and you, it feels like you need to pick a side, that there's something going on that, you know, you've got to stand up or saying that you, you need to stand up. And if you don't stand up, then this is what you're for. And, and it just gets so confusing that you need to feel a certain way about everything that is happening. And it's overwhelming sometimes. And it gets to a point even that, that if you don't feel like I feel, if you don't feel a certain way, then you are a fill-in-the-blank, whatever it may be. Well, I was going through social media not too long ago, and there was a Facebook post from a, a Crossbridger and I actually asked if I had permission to kind of read this, and they said, absolutely. And I just want you to read or hear what, what they said. Here's what they said. Listen, we're being awfully toxic with each other. No one is enjoying the current situation, and being impatient and judgmental is only making it worse. I wish this was only a Facebook thing, but it's happening everywhere, in stores, in parking lots, in our homes. I'd love to step away from social media for a week to recover, but that won't do it. We're in the midst of a tragedy, and instead of trying to help each other through it, our immediate concern is where to place the blame. It's getting very Lord of the Flies. I didn't know what that meant, so I had to actually look that up. <laughs> you look it up later. I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> We're not being very good to each other, and that, more than anything else, is wearing me down. Man, that's what I, when I read that, I said, that is it. You know, there's been days, you know, this week and the last few weeks that I got in the afternoon, and I'm just tired. I said, man, I just need to take a nap. And it's not that I'm really tired. I think what it is, is that I'm just getting worn down. Maybe you are the very same way. Are you being worn down with everything that's going on? How did we get here? And I would just love, before we get started today, just everybody take a big, deep breath. And just think and maybe pray. And what I want you to do is just focus on where you are and how you are feeling at this stage. What's going on in your life. And what I mean by that is just how do you really feel? Where do you fit into all this chaos that is happening around us? So just stop and think for a moment. And relax. What I'm about to do is go through a list of words. And I want you just to recognize your reaction. I want you to recognize just kind of how you feel. And when I go through these, I want you to understand that some of these may be controversial. <laughs> some of them is going to make us do some self-evaluation. And that's what I'm hoping for today. And so as you sit here, just notice your reaction to just a simple phrase, a simple word, and just kind of put it in your mind, if you will, all of us together. So here we go. Black lives matter. All lives matter. Defund the police. Defend the police. Peaceful protest. Riots, 
Republican. Democrat. Trump. Obama. Racist. Fascist. LGBTQ. Wearing a mask. Not wearing a mask. When you heard those words, what happened? How did you feel? What was the reaction? I know as I was putting this together and talking with some of the staff and, and as we worked through these words, I had emotions. I had reactions to some of these words. I had feelings. I had preconceived notions. I had all kinds of stuff that was going on when I read through this list. I had them. Some of you may be sitting out there actually frustrated right now, not knowing exactly where I'm going to head or where I'm going to go at this point. Maybe you're just trying to figure that out and, and say, well, which side do I belong to? Maybe you're trying to figure all that out. But what I'm really trying to get you to do is this, and this only, is to understand and admit that you have a filter, that you have a way of you look through Everything that's happening in your life, everything that's happening in your family, everything that's happening in your community, the things you're reading on social media, the articles you're reading, the news you're listening to, everything that you feel, everything that is going on around you, you have a filter. You have a bias. And that we run and we decide everything in our lives through that filter. That's all I want you to do is just admit, yes, I have one. I have a filter. And so for the rest of this morning, what I'm asking you to do is set aside that filter. <laughs> and it's almost impossible. No matter how many times I went through this, this whole teaching today, and practicing and, and going through it and struggling with it, it was very hard for me to set down my filter. So I know it's difficult. You can pick it up afterwards if you want to. Whatever you decide to do is fine. But realize that you have a filter and do everything you can to set it down and to put it away. And I want you to understand that I'm not going to sit here and try to persuade you one way or another on any issue today, okay? And maybe that will frustrate some of you. Some of you say, well, yeah, you, well, you need to take a stand. You need to do this. You need to do that with all these issues around us, and I get that. But that's not where we're actually heading today. I'm not trying to persuade or influence either side of any issue that you may be facing or dealing with or wanting today. And again, that may frustrate you. And you may be sitting up out there and listening and say, you know what, I'm going to listen for his bias, and it may come through. I hope not. Because I think there's something at the deep seat of all of this that is so important for us, especially as Jesus followers, that we have got to get right. That if we don't start from this place within, we will never solve any issues that we're facing. And I'll just say right up front that I do have an agenda today. It's an agenda for each of us, including me. And that agenda is this, is to check our heart. To check our heart and compare it to what God's heart is. For us to figure out how, what God's heart is and how we can reflect God's heart to our families and to our communities and to our workplaces and to all of those things. And I want to start by a piece of scripture a story that's in Scripture that Jesus actually tells, and it's a very familiar story. Even if you didn't grow up in, the church, in church, you probably know the story. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, if you want to get your Bibles, your U versions there. But Jesus is talking to a crowd, and the subject matter he's talking about is, is this, is what's important to God? What is important to him? And it's a great place to start, isn't it? Is it honestly, if you just break it down to that, that's where we should start? What does God think about this? What is his heart in this situation? Shouldn't that be the basis for everything that we say, everything that we do, everything that we write? What's important to God? What is his heart? And it boils down to loving God and loving others. And that's exactly where Jesus is heading here. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. And I love how he starts that right away, that he stood up. And it wasn't really an honest whole conversation. He already had some preconceived ideas. He already had his own filter. 
and he stood up to talk to Jesus and was going to test him. Not a very wise thing to do, honestly. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, he is so brilliant. He always asks a question. He enters into a conversation. It's not just a one and done. It's not just a list of do this, do this, do this. What he tries to do is engage us where we are, engage us in our filter, engage us in our heart so that we can wrestle with everything that's going on and figure out for our own selves, what does my heart say and where should I be? I love when Jesus does this. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. He knows the right answer. He's been to all the Sunday school classes. He's heard it preached, love God, love others, and he gives the correct answer to Jesus. But Jesus knows that's not really where his heart is, and he's going to continue to engage and ask the questions, dig deeper, make him wrestle with what's really going on inside of him. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now listen to the next verse. But he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to justify himself. And how many times are we looking to justify ourselves? How many times are we looking to justify our position? How many times are we looking to justify how we're feeling? What we want to happen, our filter, our bias, we want to justify it, don't we? Just like this guy. And Jesus goes on, and it's just amazing. He says, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> He's looking for this loophole. Of who really are you talking about here, Jesus? Who is it that I really have to love? It's the same question that we ask. Here's Jesus. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. And he's going to put this gentleman and all his listeners all the sinners that were there, all the religious leaders, everybody that was listening, he's going to bring them all into a story so he can make an incredible point, one that if he was here today, I think he would make the exact same point to us in the world that we are living in today. And I think our response comes in three forms today, and the first one is this one, is that, that we just have to notice the need. Here is a guy that is stripped naked, beaten alongside the road. Will we notice him will anyone in this story actually notice him do you notice the need and here's here's what happens there's this underlying need of this person a priest happened to be going down the same road and we saw the man notice that he sees him he saw the man he passed on the other side maybe he had good reason to so too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. They see him and do nothing. We are around people all the time, whether they agree with us or whether they don't agree with us, and they are in need, especially in these times. They are struggling with stuff that's happening in their lives. Will we see the need? Will we take the time to look for other people, even if they disagree with us? Maybe they're on the other side of the issue. Will we look and say, what is the underlying need? What is the underlying cause of what's making them feel that way? That's where the conversation has got to start. We can find all kinds of reasons to walk by. We can find all kinds of reasons to dismiss a stance. But the question for us today is, will we look and see the need. Who is it around us? Maybe it's ourselves that have this need. And we're acting, we're out of that need, looking for answers, looking for help, looking for hope. And then Jesus goes right to the heart of this whole thing. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And in our culture, in our generation today, we have no idea how radical this was. These people listening to this story could not have imagined Jesus going there. 
They can't imagine what Jesus is actually saying at this point. Samaritans and Jews, no way. There is no possible way they would ever get along. What Jesus is doing is pulling them out of their comfort zone. Jesus is taking them and putting them in a situation where, man, things are, are, are not what they seem to be. This is so radical in this day and age. See, there are centuries of division here. There is centuries of conflict. It's an absolute mess in this culture. There are centuries of racial divide here. Does it sound a little familiar to us today? Centuries of people living polar opposites, having two different views, having two different perspectives, having two ways of living life, never agreeing, never seeing eye to eye. There is so much division here that there is no way to solve any of this. We have to see the need. The second thing we have to do is break through a barrier. That's exactly what this Samaritan does. He knows that he has all kinds of barriers if he's going to help. He sees this need, and if I'm going to help, I'm going to have to break through some of the barriers. I'm going to have to break through some of the barriers of comfort of what I would rather do. I'm going to have to break through all the, the barriers of the social norms of what is happening in, in society today, in the culture. I'm going to have to break through religious thinking. I'm going to have to get through this, this whole process of, of dealing with this. I'm going to have to break down the barriers of, of this religion that's there. I have to break down the barriers of status because Samaritans were the lowest of lows to these Jews. And they have to break down the barrier of race. And this Samaritan, if he would have walked by, I'm sure all the people, all his Twitter friends and all his Facebook friends would have said, oh, yeah, you, you can walk by. It's no problem. You're totally different. He would have had all kinds of support from Twitter world and Facebook world, but he couldn't do it because he noticed the need. And he said, I will break through any barrier that it takes, no matter what. So the question for us today is what barriers exist between the people surrounding us? Those people who maybe think differently than any of us. What barriers need to come down in our lives? The story goes on. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which brings us to our third point is that there's a price to pay if we're going to fix this thing. It's going to cost us something to love our neighbor. Jesus goes on and says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And he's got this, this expert in the law who was testing him and trying to justify himself right where he wants him. And the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And I believe he would tell us today, go and do likewise. See the need. Break down any barriers that exist. And be willing to pay the price as Jesus promised. Our hearts has got to be in line with God's heart. Who is our neighbor today? Who are we walking by? Who are we? Who are you dismissing because of the stance that they have? Who is it that you would say, I disagree with everything they stand for, everything they believe? They're my neighbor. Every one of us has neighbors. We have a mask-wearing neighbor. We have a non-mask-wearing neighbor. We have a black neighbor. We have a brown neighbor. We have a white neighbor. We have a Democrat neighbor. We have a Republican neighbor. We have a gay neighbor. 
That's who we are to love. There's a pastor who said this, and I just want to read what he said. He said, when anyone anywhere of any color, race, any culture, any character is lying on the side of the road in need, as Jesus followers, we relish the opportunity to notice. We relish the opportunity to break through the barrier. We relish the opportunity to pay the price for their healing. It's who we are. It's what we do. That is is how we are called to live. Yeah, but Brad, but they, you know, they're just so wrong. And here's what, love your neighbor. We don't get to get to walk on by anyone at any time. And you may be saying, well, you know, when I stand up and when I say, I get that. Where's the heart coming from? Is it coming from a position of love? Is it coming from wanting to heal and restore? That's where we have to be. That's how we have to live. How we treat people, how we post about things. I just want to close today with another very familiar piece of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Many of you probably had this read at your wedding. And I want us just to really listen to what is being said here. Because if we can do this, we will change the world. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. There is a lot of clanging cymbals and resounding gongs going on right now in the Christian community. It's just true. I follow all kinds of, of, of places on social media, of different churches and, and groups and, and nonprofits and, and what have you, and I watch what is being posted in the Christian community to other Christians. And I am in belief that we treat each other that way, that we treat anybody. Can we just not be a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So what is love? Paul's going to tell us love is patient. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. When we're speaking to others, are we patient? Are we kind? When we're typing our responses, when we're posting whatever it is, are we patient? Are we kind? It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. This next one just wrecked me. It does not dishonor others. Period. Actually, it's a comma. But you get my point. It does not dishonor others. No matter what. No excuses. No loopholes. It does not dishonor others. If what we say, if what we write, if what we are thinking does, dishonors others, we are not doing it right, church. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. How many times have we seen wrong after wrong? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes. And always perseveres. Here's what I'm saying today. This is where it all starts. We can't have any other discussion about anything. Whether it be about 
whether it be about race, whether it be about politics, whether it be about religion, we, that anything that there is out here, if we are not coming from it from a heart that resembles God, that is next to God's, that is coming out of nothing but love, then we're going to fail. And nothing we do will change. Our communities won't change. Our country won't change. Our world won't change. The basis of everything comes out of a heart centered on how Jesus loves. Love God and love others. And I want you to know that I am preaching to myself as much as anybody else today. I don't do this well. But it's something that I know that I have got to do. And I've got to get rid of my filters and come back and say, where's my heart in this? Where can I have a conversation just like Jesus did so that we can get to a point where we can have a a loving conversation and find out where we actually agree so we can move on and make a better place for each and every one of us. Church, can we just learn to love? Can we do everything we possibly can this week to look at everything through this filter that Jesus showed this expert of the law? Love God, love others. Would you pray with me? Father, this is so convicting. (laughs) And it's so challenging. You know how much I struggle with this. And I'm sure there's others out here that struggle also. And maybe even as we're speaking here, we have all these things coming inside of us and saying, yeah, but what if, but but what about this? And I get that. But God, I just pray that you would impress on each and every one of us to check our heart and make sure that it's coming out of a place of love. Loving you and loving others, God, help us to be so much better than what we're being right now so that we can get through these times that we are in and come out at such a much better place. God, I just pray that as we go into our own worlds, that you would just put us in places that we have the opportunity to love those who are different than us and love others well. It's an amazing, matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.